Okay. This is the important piece. And we talked about this. stimulates a muscle to contract. If you look at the basic parts of the neuron, right, we talked about the cell body, the fact that it has a nucleus, and it will make proteins. And the proteins that it makes are these things called uh, neurotransmitters. So these neurotransmitters are actually formed in the nucleus of the neuron, and then they're transported down the cytoplasm of the axon and they're stored in the little at knob of the axon. That's called, that end right there is called the presynaptic synaptic knob. You probably think of me as a presynaptic knob. Or maybe post. After this class, it'll be posted. <laughs> Anyways, so watch. In the axon, motor nerves are myelinated. And again, the only place that an action potential, a nerve impulse, an electrical impulse is generated is at the node of Ranvier. And it allows that electrical impulse to appear to hop from one bare spot to the other. And that's that saltatory conduction which speeds the electrical impulse by many times, as opposed to going all the way down the axon. <clears throat> now, in a motor nerve, the neurotransmitter that as, is at the end of that knob that's stored is always acetylcholine. The neurotransmitter for skeletal muscle contraction is always acetylcholine. Greg? What's the neurotransmitter for skeletal muscle contraction? Get this right, swig off my diet Mountain Dew, and I'll let you sniff this Expo marker for the rest of the class. It's acetylcholine. Here, do you want to sniff on that? Yeah. You sure? I used to have these things when, before they had computers, and by the end of the day, like, I was high. I'm like, why am I, like, because I'd be sniffing that stuff. Not intentionally, but then when Noah was around, I grabbed the uh, racer. <laughs> That's so stupid. Okay, are you ready? Now, if you recall, nerves do not touch other nerves, and they don't touch the cells that they innervate. How they communicate is by releasing a neurotransmitter. Say yes, you got me. So watch, I'm going to simplify it, then I'm going to get a little more complicated. As that electrical impulse is generated by that motor nerve, it's going to travel and hop down the bunny trail. And when that electrical impulse gets to the end of that presynaptic knob, the electrical impulse itself is going to cause the release of acetylcholine. Are you with me? Okay. So now I'm going to explain to you how the skeletal muscle contracts. Now look, this is this is important. Skeletal muscle and cardiac muscle are identical in terms of how they contract. The real difference between cardiac muscle and skeletal muscle is where they get their calcium <coughs> from. If you recall, when we talked about the action potential in a motor nerve, we talked about two electrolytes, sodium and potassium, correct? But in cardiac muscle, calcium is also involved in the generation of the action potential. But the difference between cardiac and skeletal muscle is that skeletal muscle relies on calcium already stored inside it. So blood levels of calcium are not going to affect the skeletal muscle contraction specifically because calcium is stored inside the muscle cell. Now watch. Why is that important? Well. This is why it's important. If you gave somebody a calcium channel blocker for their blood pressure, and skeletal muscle relied on calcium
calcium from the blood to contract. Their blood pressure would drop, but they would be paralyzed. So they can't move, but my blood pressure is good. That drug would not sell well. Tell me you got that. So again, what's really important to remember is in skeletal muscle, skeletal muscle, the calcium stored inside it. So watch. Here you have the little presynaptic knob right here. Right? This is presynaptic. And these little red balls are acetylcholine. Now watch. As that electrical impulse travels over the presynaptic membrane, it's going to cause acetylcholine to be released from that presynaptic membrane. And acetylcholine is going to float through the space between the muscle cell membrane and that presynaptic knob called the presynaptic cleft with me and it actually floats and then it binds to what appears to be bongos these little green things don't they kind of resemble bongos a little bit no maybe only in my head here we go so watch let me get a good color I'm going to use blue in order for a motor nerve to stimulate a muscle to contract. It's got to release acetylcholine. And acetylcholine has to bind with, you're not going to believe this, acetylcholine receptors. And when acetylcholine, right here, binds with acetylcholine receptors, and I'm going to skip some of this, it's going to cause the muscle cell membrane to generate an electrical impulse. Now this is important. This is important. Skeletal muscles are incapable of generating their own electrical impulse. They have to be stimulated by a motor nerve. So anything that would cause damage to your spinal cord, where the motor area of the brain couldn't communicate with the skeletal muscles, those skeletal muscles will no longer contract using your brain. Tell me you got that. You will be paralyzed. Your heart as we learned, does not need nerves to make it contract, right? Because it's naturally leaky to sodium and calcium. So again, if you rip somebody's heart out of their chest, that's probably happened to you if you're under 25. You did. When you do that, that heart will still beat. But a skeletal muscle needs a nerve to stimulate it to contract. It can, it can generate an electrical impulse, but it has to be stimulated first by a motor nerve. So that's where these people who are paralyzed, they're developing these microprocessors that you put on their leg and it's computer generated. So they'll stimulate the muscle and the person can walk. The muscle still works. It just can't be stimulated by a motor nerve. So what they're doing now is with computers is they're actually trying to generate implanting microprocessors into people's spinal cord to stimulate it, to mimic them moving. Tell me you got that. And here's the other thing. If a muscle doesn't contract, it will begin to atrophy. So people who are quadriplegic or paraplegic, they develop contractures. Their arms and legs start to stiffen up. And the reason for that is the muscle atrophies, the tendons become very, very tight. And that's why they develop contractures. That's why if you take care of a quad or a paraplegic person, they have to go through range of motion. And the purpose of that range of motion is to prevent the contractures.
Okay, yeah, you're following this. Okay. So, watch. We got acetylcholine released. It's going to bind to acetylcholine receptors, and inside, in the muscle cell membrane, you have sodium and potassium voltage-gated channels. And these sodium potassium voltage gated channels are going to open up and it's going to generate that electrical impulse over the muscle cell membrane. Are you with me? That's why if you, if you stick electrodes, like you ever, a uh, TENS unit, you've heard of a TENS unit? Transcutaneous electrical neural stimulation. You got a bad back, they stick that on there, they start cranking up the electricity. That will send an electrical impulse to those muscles and cause them to contract. See, so you're following. Okay. So, this is what I want. Where is I want all this fixed. Oh, forget that. Just do this. All right, so watch. little acetylcholine. In this case, acetylcholine looks like boomerangs. Acetylcholine is going to be released through the process of exocytosis. It's going to float through the synaptic cleft and it's going to bind to acetylcholine receptors. When acetylcholine binds to those receptors, it's going to activate voltage-gated sodium potassium channels along the muscle cell membrane. Are you with me? That's going to cause that electrical impulse to travel over the muscle cell. Skip in here. Get that. And as that electrical impulse travels over the muscle cell membrane, inside the muscle, this little green place right here, whoops, this little green place, stores the calcium. The storage of calcium in skeletal muscle is called the sarco plasmic reticulum. The sarcoplasmic reticulum contains calcium. The only way to get the calcium out of the sarcoplasmic reticulum is to stimulate that muscle and then that muscle will generate an electrical impulse. Better get the, I want this. In Embedded in the membrane of the sarcoplasmic reticulum are called voltage-gated calcium channels. And these voltage-gated channels are opened when that electrical impulse travels over the muscle cell membrane. Are you with me? Who's following this so far? So watch. And when you contract muscles, you don't see it because it's covered with skin but your muscles actually light up. They sparkle a little bit. So if you were to rip some of your skin off, you could actually see the sparkling inside the muscle. Anyone want to be a volunteer? No? Okay. Here's the other thing. There are little springs on the voltage-gated channels. That's why as people age, they get, they creak, like their muscles will creak. You ever hear that? That's why they're encouraged elderly to drink WD-50 along with their Geritol. <laughs> I actually had a student write that on the test. There are springs. <laughs> now watch, watch. The calcium, once released from the sarcoplasmic reticulum, is going to flood into the actin and myosin filaments. Now watch. Cardiac muscle and skeletal muscle contraction is identical. You got me? So here we go. Wait. Oh, wait. I had it. So watch. This is myosin. And this is what's called the myosin head. And on the myosin head is a molecule of A. T P. Are you with me? E E. Now, in order for a muscle to contract, the myosin head, illustrated as a blue chicken leg, has to bind 
with the actin molecule. In this case, it looks like partially chewed beer nuts. So you can actually see where the person's molar bit that peanut. Are you ready? So the big molecule here, actin, then you have myosin, the myosin head. Sitting on the myosin head is ATP. Now, in a relaxed muscle, there's this blue licorice whip, and that blue licorice whip is called tropomyosin. And tropomyosin covers the active site. This active site is what allows, there's a natural attraction between the myosin head and the active site. If tropomyosin is covering that active site, the myosin head cannot bind to the actin molecule. Now, this is also important. Sitting on the tropomyosin molecule is the troponin complex. The troponin complex, this is called troponin C. And Guess what binds to troponin C? Calcium binds to troponin C. And when calcium binds to troponin C, it's going to cause the tropomyosin molecule to twist out of the way. And because there's a natural attraction between the myosin head and the active site, actin and myosin are going to bind. But what sits on the myosin head? ATP. So when the myosin head binds to the actin, it's going to cause ATP to be broken down to ADP and release that energy. And the myosin head that's now connected to the actin is going to swivel and pull the actin along with it. Observe. So now there's that natural attraction, and now you've got ATP sitting on that myosin head. And when there's a connection between actin and the myosin head, that's going to be broken down to ADP plus energy and heat. And that energy is then going to swivel the myosin head, and it is going to pull the actin molecule along with it. When you're pulling actin, you're contracting. Yeah. Tell me you follow this. Now watch. Watch. The number of nerves that stimulate a muscle will determine how many of these connections you make between actin and myosin. And the number of connections you make between actin and myosin determine the force of contraction of the heart. Skeletal muscle is no different than cardiac muscle. If you stretch it, you align the actin and myosin better, so the force of contraction becomes better. So like in the Olympics now, they're talking about platform diving, and they go, oh yeah, dude, bounce. Because when you bounce, you will stretch the calf muscle, and then they can do more flips and stuff. That's why they take points off. But it doesn't matter anyways, because most of them are taking steroids. Yeah. How many people followed that? You got me? So observe. Bam. Bam. Yeah, I'm just taking a walk. Now, watch. If you want the muscle to contract, what do you have to do? If you want it to relax, you want the muscle to relax. Right, or watch, when acetylcholine binds there, right, as long as acetylcholine is there, that muscle is going to contract. So in order to relax the muscle, you have to remove that acetylcholine. And you're not going to believe this, but there's an enzyme called acetylcholine. It's actually one word, but I don't have enough room. Esterase. And that degrades that um, 
acetylcholine. Then what do you got to do? Once the electrical impulse is stopped, you have to get the calcium back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So embedded in the sarcoplasmic reticulum is a pump called the calcium pump. And it will pump calcium. And you actually have what appears to be a little spoon that you get when you get some ice cream at Baskin Robbins. <laughs> and it will actually pump the calcium back in. Tell me you got that. You're following this. Yes or no? That, this is a picture of me too, just so you know. That's me too. I had a really good tan. Yeah. This is what I looked like before. Then I started taking steroids. Now look at me. Yeah. Tell me you got that. Okay. Have you ever heard of a condition called myasthenia gravis? Really? Have you heard of it? Do you know what it is? Do you want to know what it is? Why not, right? Okay, I'm going to explain it very quickly. Watch. Myasthenia gravis is an autoimmune disease where the B cells attack and destroy acetylcholine receptors. If you attack and destroy acetylcholine receptors, I don't care how much you uh, release acetylcholine, if it can't bind to acetylcholine receptors, it's not going to work. So myasthenia gravis is actually Greek for grave muscle weakness. So these people develop severe muscle weakness. So watch, there's a drug out there, and I forget the name, that prevents acetylcholine esterase from breaking down the acetylcholine. And if you prevent that from breaking down the acetylcholine, any acetylcholine that is released will continue to stimulate that muscle. Have you ever heard of a drug called Pavulon? Have you ever heard of it? Pavulon is a um, drug that they use during general anesthesia. Pavul Surgeons don't like it when patients move when they're cutting them. You should write that down. So in addition to general anesthesia that uh, anesthetize the brain so you don't feel anything, you also have to uh, paralyze skeletal muscle. So they give you a drug called Pavulon. Pavulon blocks acetylcholine receptors in skeletal muscle. Now listen up, because this is true. If you give someone Pavulon, the diaphragm is a skeletal muscle. So if you give them Pavulon, they won't be able to contract their diaphragm, so they will suffocate. So before you give somebody pavulon, they better be on a ventilator. Otherwise, you're going to be saying, do you want fries with that burger? Tell me, right? And it's real simple, but I've seen it happen before. The doctor orders pavulon, and they give it to them before the patient's intubated, and then they die. Do you know what tolerance is? I'm an example of tolerance. I'll put up with you guys. <laughs> tolerance with like drugs and alcohol means you have to take more of the drug to get the same effect. Tell me you got this. This is a true story. I, I can't make this up. There was a dude, he was a heavy duty drinker and drug addict. So his stomach and his esophagus were so bad that they removed his esophagus, removed part of his lung, and put his stomach up here. So I took care of him when he came out of surgery, and he was bouncing off the walls because he was going through DTs. You with me? So I told, I called the surgeon, look, you gotta, I gotta paralyze this guy, otherwise, He's going to tear a stitch. He's going to be going back to surgery. So he said, give him some Versed and Pavulon. Versed 
puts them out. They go night night. Pavulon paralyzes their skeletal muscle. So you're supposed to give the Versed first, then the Pavulon. And know this, when you give them Pavulon, their brain works. They just can't move anything. So I didn't, this guy was a pain in the ass. <laughs> so I gave him the Pavulon first. <laughs> and then before I gave him the Versed, I said, be nice. And I pushed the Versed and he went to sleep. But you should have seen, man, that freaking guy's heart rate just went like, because he was going like this. And then, oh, so remember that. Always give the verse set first. Did and how, he die? No. <laughs> he was intubated. He just fresh out of surgery. Yeah. <laughs> they had a, can I tell you another Pavillon story? There was a nurse, she was, uh, she had been a nurse there for like 25 years. And uh, you don't know this yet, but the antidote for heparin is called Protamine, protamine sulfate. The drugs that we had were in alphabetical order and this patient of hers was bleeding out. So instead of giving protamine, she gave pavulon. So the guy was like this and then couldn't move and they thought he stroked out. So they're doing MRIs and CAT scans and then the pavulon wore off and then she looked and she's like, oops. 25 years. Now she ain't a nurse no more. So I say it unto you. Don't learn this stuff. So you will have no job, no money, no apartment, no car, no VCR, and you'll have to live with killing yourself, killing someone for the rest of your life. Tell me you got that. That's how cardiac are up. A motor nerve is able to stimulate muscles to contract, and that's how skeletal muscle contracts. Say yeah, you got that. All right, let's see. <laughs> what else we gotta do? Twenty-four. Okay, wait. One of the things uh, apparently I didn't do was No, I'm going to do that. Yeah, I'll do that. Yeah, explain why individuals with liver damage uh, can develop jaundice. Did I explain that? I did. That's the uh, bilirubin and the bile. And, okay, good. All right. Did I explain to you why uh, people with liver damage develop GI bleed? It's in that video. It is. I did? Oh, I did. Okay, great. All right, okay, here we go. I'm gonna explain to you, um, I'm gonna go over the uh, eyes and the ears, the special senses, I have to do that. So if you want to, uh, you don't have to listen to this part, but I have to do it. Otherwise I get in trouble. Just so you know, people, uh, uh, they don't have uh, one complete eye color. That's because the iris is made up of circular and radial bands of muscle. Did you know that? And how they're arranged determine um, the pigment. All right, so watch. First of all, uh, why you got two eyes and not just one big one? That's right. Predators have eyes in the front and they're spaced a little bit to give binocular vision for depth perception. Prey have eyes on their side so they can see all bad stuff coming 360. All right, here we go, hang on. All right, look. The outer part of the eye, right? You have the lacrimal gland located in the upper eyelid and when you go boo-hoo, there's little drains that drain it down into the nasal lacrimal duct and out your 
know, the purpose of tears, um, I don't know why you cry when you're sad. Anybody know why you cry when you're sad? Well, some women cry when they're happy, too, so go figure. <laughs> Do you see I'm not arguing with that at all? <sighs> you keep saying that to yourself. Okay. All right. This part here, pupil, that's where uh, light comes in. Then you have the iris. And really what determines the color of your iris is um, genetics. That's what it does. And don't ask me why some people can have two different color eyes. Just the way it is. And who cares? Tell me you got that. All right? I'm going to just zip through this. Okay, if you look at the cross-section of an eye, cross-section of an eye, right? The eye is divided into two chambers, the anterior chamber, and the anterior chamber contains a fluid called, um, anybody know? It's called, I'll just tell you. It's called aqueous humor, right? And aqueous humor, is produced by these little ciliary bodies and then will flow through the pupil and the function of aqueous humor is actually to, uh, twofold. It's to nourish the cornea and remove the metabolic waste from the cornea and it helps uh, determine interocular pressure. So directly behind the iris you have the lens. The lens is translucent protein and it's made in concentric rings, so this little protein is layered. And the function of the lens is to focus the light on the back of the retina. Now, this is kind of interesting. Well, I'll just do this really fast. Now, your eyes don't move in and out like a tele telephoto lens, but you have the ability to accommodate. You can look at something very close and then look at something far away, and you're able to adjust almost instantaneously. The reason for that is the lens is actually suspended behind the iris by these little suspensatory ligaments, and they're connected to what are called ciliary muscles. And what will happen is when you look at something close and far away, these muscles will contract and relax, and they will change the shape of the lens. And by changing the shape of the lens, you are able to focus on something far away or something very close. Now, as you age, just like everything else, it starts breaking down. This protein that makes up the lens is translucent, it's clear. But sometimes that protein can become denatured, and it can become cloudy and you get cataracts. So cataracts is a clouding of the lens. Now, if you look here, here's a blown up version of those ciliary bodies. These ciliary bodies are what produce aqueous humor, and that aqueous humor then travels through the pupil and then into the anterior chamber to nourish the cornea, which is living, and remove the metabolic waste. And the metabolic waste then is drained into these little canals of Schlem and then into the venous blood and returned to the right side of the heart. Now in some people, especially diabetics, those canals of Schlem can become blocked with protein debris and you still make the aqueous humor, but you can't effectively drain it. So because of the increased production of aqueous humor and you can't drain it effectively, your um, interocular pressure goes up and you develop a condition called um, glaucoma. So glaucoma is buildup of intraocular um, pressure and it's typically due to an increased production of aqueous humor and its inability to be drained effectively. So there are drugs out there Beta blockers actually prevent these ciliary bodies from producing aqueous humor. So 
if uh, you know somebody's got glaucoma, they put eye drops in. It's actually a beta blocker that's um, used for that. Other uh, times, they're prescribed um, THC, tetrahydrocannabinoid, um, cuckoo for dopo puffs. They get the medical marijuana. So if you take medical marijuana because you have glaucoma, um, then you get the good stuff. <laughs> also, pot dilates your pupils. That's why I think you, you have, you know, you take a couple of hits or whatever. Then this is how people look. And then they're eating all the time. <laughs> need like a welding shield when you go. <laughs> I don't know about that. I just heard. My buddy I found out, he's selling pot illegally in Colorado. <laughs> he's an idiot. I it, it is, but he's doing it illegally. They used to find these big pot uh, fields, and then they would burn them. People would line up on the side of the road. <laughs> you think I'm lying? That's what they would do. <laughs> Cuckoo for dopo puffs, huh? I like that. Okay. All right, now look. The posterior chamber of the eye is filled with a clear gelatinous mess called... Um, vitreous humor. Vitreous humor is kind of like a, like a uh, not yet done jello, right? You know how you put your finger in, it's kind of jelly-like, but it ain't completely done. That's vitreous humor. And um, basically the function of vitreous humor is to maintain the shape of the eyeball. Um, you know, in uh, aminals, like when you're driving on the highway at night and then you look at the deer and you see that little purplish color, that's called the tapeta lucidum. And the tapeta lucidum allows more light to be concentrated on the retina. So nocturnal animals have that. We don't. We just see the retina. Isn't that interesting? If you say tapeta lucidum at the final, I will give you money, probably a million dollars. Can I tell you this real quick story about the tapeta lucidum, please? They have this take your kid to work day. So um, they always uh, con me into like cutting open hearts and eyes and stuff like that and have the kids look at them. So I was going over the cow eye and I said to him, I said, look, when you get back to your little lunch get together, you're gonna see Brian Albert, the president. This is no joke. If you say tap it or loose it up to him, he will give you a million dollars. So I had two kids come back. They go, how do you spell that? <laughs> <laughs> Come on, that's a little bit funny, right? All right. Okay. All right, what I want to do now is uh, talk to you about how you take photons of light and convert it into electrical impulses. And that occurs in the retina. And the retina lines the inner surface of the posterior chamber. And I'll just tell you this. There are two cell types found in the retina. They are rods and cones, right? Rods are see in dim light and are used for uh, night vision. That's why people with uh, uh, glaucoma, rods are affected uh, first. So the first uh, sign of glaucoma is loss of night vision. And then cones are for sharp vision and they see in um, color. Now, when you're studying for, uh, not this class, but probably another class, watch. If you looked at something straight on, the greatest concentration of rods and cones is in the fovea. So looking at something directly gives you the sharpest vision and the most detail. As you move out into the periphery, 
there are less cones, so the detail becomes less. Tell me you got that. So you can see shapes and things, but it's difficult to determine color. Now, the optic disc is actually pretty cool. I think it is. The optic disc is where the optic nerve, the retinal artery, and retinal vein exit the back of the eye. And there are no rods and cones in that area. So everyone should have like a little field of just completely dark vision. But your occipital lobe is able to interpolate that. I'm sorry, yeah, interpolate. They're able to fill in the missing points so that your field of vision is completely solid. Don't you think that's cool? I think that's amazing. All right, so the photons of light are then Photons of light that enter the eye are focused on the retina. And what's interesting to note is that the image that's focused on the retina is actually upside down. And it is the job of the optic, the occipital lobe, to turn it right side up. And that's what it does. So once you convert these electrical impulses, uh, these photons of light into electrical impulses created by the rods and cones. That electrical impulse travels through the optic nerve to the occipital lobe and it's converted into sight. So that's how the eye works. All right, that didn't take too long. All right, I'm going to explain now number. Fifteen. How you hear a sound? Are you ready? Let me give you some overview of just some of the anatomy of the of the ear. The outer portion of the ear is called the pinea or oracle. Uh, the function of the pinea is actually to funnel sound waves into the external auditory canal. Now watch. The external auditory, uh, auditory canal is covered with skin, the inner portion. But it has modified sweat glands that don't sweat. They actually produce um, earwax. Just so you know, your ear is self-cleaning. The skin of the ear will actually sloth off from the inner part and it will start moving outward. The only time that you need to get your ears clean is because you stick stuff in there and smash that earwax down. So don't clean your ears. Instead of cleaning your ears, read the textbook. Right that time. You ever see someone's ears get irrigated? Ugh. I saw, and this is no joke, a Chrysler 300 come out of one of these guys' old <laughs> ears. Boom. It's in pretty good shape, too. Say, so yeah. Okay, so, and as you age, you get more hair on your ears than you do on your head. I worked with this guy when I was 13. He was bald headed and he had earmuffs permanently. You ever see people that have earmuffs permanently? You ever see that? Okay, here we go. Watch. The ear is divided into three distinct uh, chambers. You have the external ear, then you have the middle ear, and then you have the inner ear. The um, external and middle ear are separated by a concave thin protein membrane called the tympanic membrane. The middle ear is actually connected to the back of the throat through this auditory tube or eustachian tube. The auditory tube and eustachian tube have the same lining as the respiratory system, so it is mucus and ciliated. Now, sometimes you can get a sore throat and that will cause mucus buildup in the eustachian tube. The function of the eustachian tube is to allow the changes in atmospheric pressure for the middle ear and the external ear to match. If this eustachian tube is blocked, then you can't uh, change the pressure inside the middle ear, and that can actually cause your <coughs> eardrum to rupture. 
So that's why if they say if you have a stuffy ear, stuffy throat, you shouldn't be going on a plane, right? Because that can actually cause your eardrum to rupture. Now, look. Little kids, babies, up until about the age of five, and typically um, uh, up until the age of three, their eustachian tube is at a much more acute angle. As you age, the eustachian tube becomes more obtuse, more slanted. So this allows goo and stuff to go in the back of your throat. That's why kids under the age of five typically have um, get ear infections, like every six months. And here's the thing. The pediatricians do not want to treat ear infections. They're usually self-limiting. They take care of themselves. But when parents bring their little baby to the pediatrician, I'm not leaving until I get my prescription for moxicillin. So the pediatrician, here, go. I got patients to see. When in fact, it, uh, it does the kid probably more harm than good. You shouldn't be treating that. Because that can lead to multiple resistance stuff. And then when the kid gets really sick, you can't take any antibiotics. Okay, so let's look at this little video here, and then I'm going to explain to you how you see a sound, uh, how you see a sound, yeah, <laughs> and how you smell the colors. <laughs> yeah. Talking about pot, maybe they're... <laughs> articulate, they form joints with each other. See? Coming back to that THC again. <sighs> That's what we should do. <laughs> we should kind of find a pot field and burn it. <laughs> okay. So watch. The purpose of the auditory ossicles is to simply amplify the sound wave. That's its function. Inside the middle ear, there are muscles that actually stabilize the auditory ossicles. Again, the body doing stuff that makes sense. So if you're exposed to really loud noises, these muscles will contract to stabilize those auditory ossicles. That's why if you go to a, a really loud concert, like uh, maybe, maybe like uh, the Archies or John Denver, When you come out of the concert, your hearing is kind of muffled. That's because these muscles are contracted. And how long you've been exposed to that loud noise will determine how long those muscles stay contracted and your hearing is muffled. Once those muscles relax, if the bones aren't damaged, then you'll hear again. Yay. All right. So again, the malleus incus stapes connected to the tympanic membrane. So when a sound wave comes in, it's going to cause the tympanic membrane to vibrate. And that's going to cause the auditory ossicles to vibrate. Now, this is the important piece. Connected to the inner ear is the stapes. And the stapes is connected to the inner ear by this thin membrane. Now watch. That thin membrane is called the oval window. So the oval window is connected to the stapes. And that oval window is found in the cochlea. And the cochlea is fluid filled. Are you with me? Just like throwing a rock into a pond, that rock is going to create whip, uh, ripples. It's going to create waves. So the fluid in the cochlea will begin to create fluid waves as the stapes vibrates 
and moves that fluid within the cochlea. So watch. If it wasn't for the fact that the cochlea is wound like a conch shell, then our ears would be like out to here. There could be some advantages to that. Like if you're doing laundry or something, you're just hanging on. Shirts here, pants here. <laughs> so watch, I want this. Within the cochlea, within the cochlea of the ear, there are hair cells. And these hair cells within the cochlea vary in height and thickness. So each hair cell has its own resonance. Resonance meaning its own frequency of vibration. Are you with me? And inside the cochlea, there is a special organ that houses these hair cells. It's called the organ of cordy. And within the organ of Cordy, you have over 30,000 individual hair cells. And each hair cell, because it varies in height and thickness, will begin to vibrate based on a particular sound that enters the ear. So observe. So this right here is the organ of Cordy. And these guys right here are the hair cells. Now this is important. And they vary in height and thickness. So as a sound wave enters the ear, it is going to vibrate the tympanic membrane, which is going to vibrate the auditory ossicles, which then is going to cause the stapes to vibrate. And because the stapes is connected to the cochlea by the oval window, it's going to begin to vibrate and produce fluid waves within that cochlea. And those fluid waves are going to enter the cochlea and they will begin to vibrate the fluid. And because the hair cells vary in height and thickness, it's going to vibrate particular hairs within the organ of cordy. And when those hairs vibrate, they actually open up ion channels. So only the hair cells that are vibrating based on the sounds that come into your ear, when they vibrate, they're going to open up those ion channels, and that's going to produce an electrical impulse down the acoustic nerve. And then the acoustic nerve sends electrical impulses to the temporal lobe where they're interpreted into sound. Tell me you got that. You're following me. Now watch. Inside the organ of Cordy, you have these hairs that detect um, not high frequency, but uh, high decibel sound. Decibel is a measure of loudness, how loud a sound is, and then hertz measures the frequency of the sound. So these loud hairs are activated depending on the loudness of the sound. And the louder the sound, the more these loud hairs are activated, that's how your brain can interpret the loudness or the decibel level of a sound. Now, 
How many people had CNA, went through CNA training? Right, you all, most of you did, right? So they always say that when you talk to an older person, you look at them, you speak slowly, and you lower the pitch of your voice. And the reason you lower the pitch of your voice is because as people age, the bones in the middle ear cannot vibrate as quickly. And high frequency sounds have a higher frequency. <laughs> you should write that down. They can't vi these bones can't vibrate as quickly. So I'm going to give you a quiz. This will be worth 110% of your grade, 10% of your microbiology grade. <laughs> Which has a higher frequency, A or B? A. Are you willing to bet your grade on it? <laughs> you should have. You were right. See? <laughs> trick here. It's A. The bumps occur more frequently. So a higher frequency sound has a higher pitch. In order for your cochlea to be able to interpret that sound, the auditory ossicles have to vibrate quicker. As you age, those bones cannot vibrate as quickly. So people lose hearing in the higher frequencies first. That's why they tell you with old people to talk with a lower pitch. Do you see that? This is evolutionary. Two, watch. As people age, like if you've been married for maybe three months or five months and really starting to grate on you. <laughs> watch. Been married for a long time. What happens? When the husband doesn't do what they're supposed to do, the wife's voice starts getting higher. So it's evolutionary that they really can't hear them. Right? Or there'd be a lot more domestic issues. I didn't hear you. See? That's a fine example of the body doing stuff that makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> That's terrible, but it's funny. Okay, here we go. Now, okay, watch, watch. If you go to the uh, hearing doctor, right, they give you a hearing test. Hit the button when you hear something, right? There's two types of hearing loss. There's sensory neural loss, and there's conduction loss. So what they do to determine whether it's sensory neural or conduction, they do what's called the Renee's test, and it's real simple. They take a tuning fork, they hit it, right? And they hold it by your ear. They go, can you hear that? They're like, no. And then they put it on the mastoid bone. Bone conducts sound waves. So if you can hear it when they put it on the bone, then you know it's conduction loss because the inner ear is able to interpret it. If they can't hear either, you have sensory neural loss. And there's something wrong with the cochlea. And the only way that that helps is with a cochlear implant. So the only thing that a hearing aid does is simply amplify sound. So people with conduction hearing loss, the problem is here. And that's how a hearing aid works. Yeah? OK. That is how you hear a sound. Tell me you got that. Now. Repeated damage or repeatedly um, being exposed to um, high uh, decibel levels at the same frequency can damage those uh, hair cells. And when you damage those hair cells, you're, you've lost that um, hearing permanently. So firefighters who are, and police officers who are exposed to the siren all the time, they lose hearing in a particular frequency level. That's why they have to wear hearing protection. But I'll tell you, if I had to lose a sense, I'd rather be deaf than blind, right? Because there's not a lot of stuff I want to hear anyways. This class would probably be better if you were deaf. <laughs> <laughs> and blind. <laughs> and immobile. Okay, uh, that's it. All right, uh, go ahead, uh, take a break real quick, okay? And then, uh, uh, 
Uh, we'll finish. We'll finish this up. Oh, we're doing real good.